My name is Courtney Amanchek. I am a uh, school psychologist and director of school psychology services at A Plus Solutions. If you're not familiar with A Plus Solutions, it is um, an organization. We have mental health therapists here. We also have educational services. So we have tutors, we have OTs, we have speech therapists. Um, we are a John Peterson Autism Scholarship provider. Um, personally, I've been a school psychologist for 19 years. Wow. And um, been working in, I've been working in public schools, non public schools, and now um, currently in, in private practice. So, today we're here to talk about raising resilient children in the time of this COVID uh, pandemic. And I think we're talking a lot right now about resiliency. I see it all over the place. And um, it's important to talk about, not just because of COVID and what our we're all going through. Um, resiliency is was important to talk about before COVID and after COVID, whatever our new normal will be, because children and people who are resilient tend to be braver, more curious, and more adaptable. And um, I think we all want that in, for our children. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my, my PowerPoint screen with you. Um, at the end is my email address, so please feel free to email me any questions. You can also put anything in the chat and I'll try to hopefully notice that while I'm um, presenting. Let me go ahead and share this with you. Okay. There we go. Okay. And I'll just want to start off by saying this is actually my first Zoom presentation. I've done this presentation before in front of um, a live audience. So this is kind of new and interesting for me to do it um, looking at my, my computer. So what is resilience, right? Let's, we're talking about it, let's define it, right? It's the ability to bounce back from stress, right? Any setbacks you have, trauma, tragedy, any type of, any type of adversity, it's the ability to bounce back, right? You've fallen, I can get back up and I can keep going. And I think, you know, in our society today, there's sort of this prevailing thought that we need to make our kids comfortable at all times, right? We have to sort of stay one step ahead of them and help our, our kids deal with anything that they have and not let them, you know, fall too hard. You know, when there's a problem, we want to swoop in and we want to fix it. And um, I think if anything, this pandemic has taught us that change happens a lot and nothing that we planned really always, you know, goes, doesn't really always go our way. You know, I have a daughter who's a senior in high school and certainly this is not the senior year she expected. Actually, I saw um, a meme on Facebook that said, you know, the question is, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Nobody in 2010 said, well, in 2020, I see myself um, being quarantined at home because of a, you know, worldwide pandemic. Right? Nobody thought that. And so we're always encountering setbacks and challenges and resilience teaches us the ability to sort of bounce back and move forward. Um, and so what this presentation is I'm hoping to give you is some skills and some strategies to be able to use to teach our children to handle those setbacks. And it's also good, I think, for us as adults as well. So is it different? Is resilience different in the age of, in, right now in COVID-19? And not really. The skills that we're going to talk about will be the same, would be that I would talk about before COVID and after COVID, during COVID, all of that. So, but I think what we have to think about is our children have a lot of questions now. And we want to have sort of honest reinsurance as the power to strengthen resilience. So we don't want to frighten them. Um, we want to give them a feeling of hope and let them know what's going on and reassure them. And we, that kind of gives that power, like I said, to, to strengthen resilience. And whenever we're feeling, you know, anxious or stressed or overwhelmed or frustrated, I want us to sort of think about that what we're feeling is a very normal reaction to a very abnormal situation, right? And tell ourselves that, tell our kids that this isn't, um, normal, right? It is, we are nothing, nothing that we're doing right now is, is normal. Zoom learning, um, waiting 30 minutes in line to go into the grocery store, right? None of that, none of that is, is normal for us. And so we want to let ourselves and our kids know that how we're feeling is really normal reaction to a very, very abnormal situation that we're all in right now. Um, you know, we're all worrying about our safety and that was never really the case before that all of us had one, one, one common worry in that safety. I want to you know, encourage questions from our kids. If you're not sure what they're asking or don't know the information that they really want to know or how to answer them, you can kind of paraphrase them. Say like, so um, let, me, let me hear what you're trying to ask me and kind of put the question back to really define what it is that they want to know. 
want to obviously uh, validate our feelings. We'll talk a lot more about that later on. And then the other thing to think about is that um, this is a process. COVID-19 and all that we're learning is a process, not an event. It isn't something that happened once and it's over. It is a process and it keeps evolving. And every day we're learning more guidelines and what's safe and what's not safe and what we should do. And so this is a, a process and that's really important to think about and, and talk to our kids about as well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention here is just really be careful of indirect exposure. Sometimes we have the news on in the background or we're talking to our partners about something or the radio's on and um, all that can seem really scary to a, to a child. And when, especially you think they're not listening, they're hearing everything. Right? Kids have this amazing ability to not hear, go clean your room, but to hear uh, when you don't want them to hear something. So just keep that in mind and you know, mindful of the indirect exposure that um, kids might be hearing because the news portrays things as, as pretty bleak and scary. Uh, the, the good news is that resiliency can be taught and nurtured in all children. Right? It's not like I have it or I don't have it. Right? I'm resilient or I'm not resilient. Right? It doesn't work that way. Everybody has a capacity for resiliency. The capabilities that underlie resilience can be strengthened at any age. So that's a good thing. All the skills that we're going to learn today um, can be taught. It's never, it's never it's like too late, right? Everybody could do it. Everybody has the um, capability and the capacity to do it, to be resilient. Before we talk about um, how to help our kids be resilient, I want to take a moment to talk about temperament. But I think temperament is really important to consider when we're doing any type of uh, parenting. Um, temperament is inborn, you know, the, the traits we're, we're born with, and it kind of accounts for individual thing, individual differences like emotion and adaptability and self-regulation and motor skills and can be modulated by parent response and environment. And so when we talk to our kids and we parent our kids, we want to keep their temperaments in mind. You know, some kids are information seekers and they just want information all the time, all the time. Some kids are super highly sensitive. And so you have to really think about and filter what you want to say to them because it really affects them very, very deeply. And they kind of hold on to that for a long time. Um, Ch Thomas and Chess, you see here, kind of did, did they're famous temperament researchers, and they did um, a study and looked at babies, and they said that 40% um, of children are the easy child. This is a child that if you had one of these, you could have like, you know, you'd have 10 kids if all your kids were easy children, right? You, they adjust easily to new situations, they're, they calm quickly, they're generally cheerful, they quickly establish new routines. Then you've got the slow to warm up child, and that's about 15% really if babies are born that way. And these kids can be difficult at first, but then eventually they become easier over time and they may take a long time to like really feel comfortable, but eventually we'll get there. And then you've got the difficult child and that's about 10%. And these guys are very slow to adjust to new situations. They react very intensely and sometimes very negatively. Um, and so we wanna keep all these temperament traits in our mind when we do any type of parenting. I just want to bring that up. And now let's talk about, we're going to hear some stories. Stories of Josh and stories of Sam. Josh and Sam both go to the same school and are in the same grade. Um, and let's hear about the stories, uh, what happens when they come home from school. I was going to do more Zoom learning story, but then I was like, no, I really miss that my kids aren't in, in school. So I'm going to keep it to uh, a dreaming of a, of a school-based story. Brick and mortar school-based story, I should say. So Josh gets off the school bus and runs home to tell his mom that in school they're doing a play where they have large and small parts. He was thinking of trying out for the lead in the play. When he arrives at home, his mother's busy cooking dinner. Josh walks in, his mother continues cooking and says, what took you so long to get home? Josh begins to explain himself and his mother interrupts and says, oh, I told you, when you get home, hang your coat up, put your bag on the hook and your shoes go away. Oh, what do you think? You're so messy, you're gonna be living in a barn. You will never learn. Sullenly, Josh picks up his bag, coat and shoes and puts them away. His mom says, so what homework do you have? How was that math test today? You know, I really don't think you studied hard enough for that test. <sighs> Josh sighs, he goes over, he gets himself his you know, after school snack, sits down to eat it, and as he's pouring his juice, spills it all over himself, all over his shirt. Josh's mother says, I can't believe you spilled it. All over your new shirt and the table, Ugh, what is wrong with you? Why are you always so careless? As she gets the rag and she cleans up his mess. Josh eats his snack in silence and then goes to his room where he spends the rest of the afternoon, never telling his mom about his aspirations for the lead in the play. That's Josh. Let's talk about Sam. 
Sam, remember same class, same school. Sam gets off the school bus and runs home excited to tell his mom about the play that's happening in this large and small parts. And you know, he's thinking about trying out for the lead play, leading the play. Sam walks in the door, his mom is also busy cooking dinner. She stops cooking. She looks up and says, hey, I'm so happy to see you. Sam goes on to tell her about the school play and that he thinks he wants to try out for the lead, but he doesn't think he's really good enough. And his mom says, you know, I remember when you were in the camp play and you really didn't seem nervous and you like sang loudly and I could hear you from the back of the room. He says, okay, I guess I'll try out, but I'm, I'm gonna need to practice a lot. And mom says, no problem, I'll, I'll help you practice. So Sam goes and he gets his snack and as he's getting a snack, mom notices that his shoes and his coat and his bag are also on the floor. And she says, she says, Sam, uh, shoes and bag, that's not shoes, coat and bag belong in the hook, shoes away. Oh yeah, sorry, mom. And he goes and he, he puts it away. Josh goes and he sits down to snack. And of course, he spills his juice too, all over his new shirt and all over the table. His mom says, there's a rag on the counter. Josh goes, gets the rag, cleans it all up, continues to sit there and tell his mom about um, the rest of his day. So that's Josh and that's Sam, and two very different after school, after school stories. So um, if we were doing this live, I would ask you some questions and we'd have some interactions. So I'll kind of ask you and then I want you just to give you a second to think, think about it. So what are the differences in each of the story? Which home would you rather come home to? Josh's home or Sam's home? You think that Josh or Sam will try out for the lead of the play? Maybe, they might, they both might still, right? Um, how will they each react if they don't get the part, right? Let's say they tried out, they both tried out and they, neither one of them got the lead in the play. What do you think will happen then? And I think Sam is more likely to bounce back and have some resilience and say to himself something like, well, you know, I didn't get it this time, maybe next year. Josh might be like, oh, forget it, I knew it wasn't good enough. And that might be the end of his, his play aspirations. So the question I have for you, is there a connection between how children view themselves and the willingness to accept challenges or risk failures? And the answer is a big yes. There really is a connection between how they see themselves and their willingness to accept challenges or try to or risk failures. There is a, a study, Carol Dweck is the author of a book called Mindset, um, excellent book, highly recommend it. She looked at 400 fifth graders from all over the country and she divided them into two different groups. So one group was, um, and she asked them to each do puzzles, they all did the same puzzles. One group she praised for being smart. You're so smart, you're brilliant, way to go, you're awesome. And the other group she praised for their effort. You really worked hard at that, you thought, you thought through that, you put in a lot of effort on that puzzle. So we had these two groups. So we have got, we'll call it the smart group and we'll call it the effort group just to, um, make sure we understand the differences. And then she went on, there's lots of parts to this study, and then she went on and she um, gave each group a choice. Would you rather have an easy puzzle? Or would you rather have a hard puzzle in which they could learn a lot, a lot, right? And so this group that we'll call the smart group, right, they all chose the easy puzzle. The group that was praised for their effort all chose the harder puzzle, wanting to learn more. Then the next part of the study is she gave everyone deliberately a harder puzzle. So she knew everybody, all both groups would have a difficult time with this and would not do well in it. So the group, the smart group, right, they gave up. They felt dumb in encountering any setbacks. The effort group, really, they enjoyed the puzzle. They worked hard at it. Some of them even asked they could take it home to finish it at home. Then the third part of the study, she went back and gave all the groups an easy puzzle again, just like the first puzzle she gave them when she split them up knowing that they should have no problem doing this puzzle. So the smart group, right, they actually did worse than they did the first time. The group that was praised for effort, right, did better. And then after you do any type of study, you always debrief and kind of talk about what happened. And the children in the, the fourth graders, or the fifth graders, I'm sorry, in the smart group um, that are praised for their intelligence, they felt intelligence was a gift and that any effort was a sign of weakness and they wouldn't want to do anything to ruin that reputation of being smart. The group that was praised for effort um, felt set back, just needed to study more, to work harder, and that intelligence could be controlled and that they could, with effort and with time and with practice and hard work, they could do better and they could improve. And I think as parents, it's something we want for our children, right? We want them to, we want to give them the message that the process is more important than the product. Right? It's what the effort they put into studying rather than just getting the A on the test 
or that the practice they went into their, you know, their soccer game instead of just let's focus on the goal that they got, right? And so praise in this way gives children a message that, again, the process is more important than the product and it builds um, confidence and confidence in our children. So let's talk about how we often praise our kids. And so um, thinking we want to tell them how, how wonderful they're doing, and we are telling them how wonderful we're doing, but let's think about what the children are hearing and what we're, what we're saying and then what they're hearing. So I hope that makes sense. So parents often give praise. It sounds something like this. You learn that math is, you learn that math so quickly. You are brilliant. And so what your child is hearing when you say that is if I don't learn something quickly, I'm not smart. Parents often say things like, look at this amazing drawing. You are the next Monet. And what a child will hear is, I shouldn't try drawing anything hard or they'll say, I am no Monet. Another common um, parenting praise is, you are so smart, you got an A without studying. A child will hear, so it always comes up slower. I better quit studying or they won't think I am smart. And so what we have is we have evaluative praise. We're praising them for their brilliance, right? And they're drawing excellence versus descriptive praise. And so let's talk about how we give this kind of praise, this descriptive praise to children that encourages kids to challenge themselves. We want them to do that. We want them to continue to challenge and learn and to grow. There was a, I remember when I was in graduate school, we got this thing, a hundred ways to praise your kids. It was like a, it had like, I don't know, a hundred words, like awesome, great, fantastic, terrific. And they said, this is how you do it back then. And so when I tell parents, if you still have that, rip it up, tear it up. Because we know that it actually doesn't work anymore. Um, and that it's not the, the best way to praise our kids. And this way, this descriptive praise, um, they grow, they learn, they challenge, and they actually take it and can learn from this type of phrase and continue that behavior over and over and over again because they've internalized it. So here's some things we do for, to, to, do, to do descriptive praise. Describe what you see. Right? You put the blocks back where they belong, right? And when you say this, kids think, yeah, I know how to clean up. I'm pretty responsible, right? Describe what you feel. That's a pleasure to walk into a clean room. Ask questions. What was the hardest part of playing the piano, please? Or how could, you know, what is it about piano that you enjoy playing? Right? Or what is it about soccer that you like that keeps going back to every game and never missing one? Right? And this type of praise gives, gives them confidence and confidence. And I'll give you an example of, of my own family. So one of my kids was learning to ride a two-wheeler in the summer. It was, you know, June, and he kept falling off and getting back on. He was having a really difficult time figuring out how to sort of balance his body on this two-wheel bike. And I just said to him, I described it, I said, you keep trying and you fall off, you get right back on. Every time you fall off, you get right back on. That's what I call, you know, perseverance, because, you know, why not throw in a vocab word? And he did it eventually, he figured out how to ride his bike. And then fast forward till August, right before school, and he wanted a pair of Thai tennis shoes, and he did not know how to tie yet. We were, at that point, still just doing Velcro. And I said, okay, let's learn to tie shoes. And he was really struggling with learning to tie his shoes. And he looked and he said to me, you know, this is like when I was riding my bike. I kept trying and I finally got it. So I'm going to keep trying and I know I'm going to get this, this shoe tying thing. And I was like, whoa, yes, right? That's what praise does. He remembered from his earlier challenge and was able to pull from that to do the next challenge that he encountered. And that really is resiliency. Let's just give you some more examples of what descriptive descriptive praise um, might sound like. So that homework took a long time. You should be proud of yourself for the way you concentrated and finished it. You put a lot of thought into that essay and learned a lot of new information about snow leopards. Took that from, from my own kids. <clears throat> this picture has so many colors. Tell me about them. Instead of saying like, wow, that's such a cute picture, right? Just tell me about your picture. So it's real easy to praise when things go right and things go well. But what happens when things don't go well? We still want to praise and we still want to validate, right? So acknowledge kind of what happened and validate it. And then if you can't you know, kind of praise them or think about what to do next. So <clears throat> I noticed the effort you put in. Let's figure out what part you didn't understand and work on that. People learn in different ways. Let's keep trying and find the one that works for you. I know this was your favorite toy and it was hard to share with your friend. Next time I know you will come up with a solution so we can play together without fighting. So we've kind of acknowledged validated what's going on and, and help them figure out how we can move forward and what they can do next time. 
all of this and all that study we talked about is part of creating this resiliency, which is and the growth mindset. So growth mindset is a big resilience builder, right? Major kind of building block in resiliency. And I think this is so important now when we talk about distance learning. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar with the growth mindset, actually Carol Dweck, the one, the study we talked about before was the one who um, kind of coined these terms, growth mindset and fixed mindset. And in her book, Mindset, uh, talks about them. So growth mindset, right, is somebody who um, embraces challenges, somebody who puts forth effort, doesn't really give up. You know, when they fail, it's like, okay, I learned from my mistakes, right? I'm going to continue trying harder. It's somebody who feels like they have control over their intelligence and their abilities. And that when, or, and when someone else does well, they're happy for them. We're on the opposite, a fixed mindset is somebody feels like I got it or I don't got it. I'm smart or I'm not smart. There's really nothing I can do to change that. And when someone else succeeds and does well, I feel very threatened, right? And so those are the differences. We want to work on our on developing a growth mindset in our children. I think there's a lot of schools now who have really taken this and run with it and do a lot of growth mindset work within the schools. So how do we do that? How do we teach our kids um, a growth mindset? Number one, have daily learning discussions, right? At dinner, in the car, bedtime, those are all really great times to talk with our kids. Otherwise, they tend to just kind of walk away, right? When you got them trapped at the dinner table or trapped in the car or they're in their bed, right? No, that's when um, it's a really good time to talk. And tend, kids, I especially see at that time, and I especially see with boys for some reason, bedtime tends to be a really good, a good time to talk. And so, you know, usually when we come home from school, right, because what happens, or we're now in Zoom learning, right, we say, how was your day? And they're like, fine, what did you learn today? Nothing, right? Everybody learns nothing all day, you know, or how was your Zoom learning? Fine, you know, what did you do on Zoom today? Nothing, right? Nothing. They sat there for three hours in front of a screen doing nothing, right? So you want to talk about and have discussions and hear what they're doing and talk to them about it. Um, so we ask them more open-ended questions like, tell me something you learned today. Be very specific, you know. Um, what was the most challenging part of the day? Or did anything silly happen today? I know I said oftentimes at our dinner table we do what's called highs and lows, where everyone goes around telling about something high, something good that happened to them, and a low, something that was not good about their day. And we have discussions. And it's important for us as parents to really model that and answer those questions as well. And be a part of telling our kids something that, you know, about our day. And we talked about this with praise, get feedback on process only. So one, again, praise for the effort, the persistence, the planning, the creativity, right? And not the evaluative praise, like smart, pretty, amazing, awesome, right? We want to sort of move away from that type. And they actually lead, like we said, to a loss of confidence instead of gain of confidence, like we want in our um, descriptive praise. We want our kids to know that grains can grow. Within the past decade, there's been a ton, a ton of research on, on this that um, the wiring in the brain can change with experiences that it's ex exposed to. So there's a saying, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. So the right experiences can really um, shape a child in a way to build a resilience. And so we want them to know it's a muscle. And the more practice that we do, it's something the stronger it becomes and the better at it we get. Encourage risk, failing, and learning from mistakes. So failure teaches resiliency. We cannot wrap them in bubble wrap and protect them, even though that's what we really, 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 really want to do. Um, we have to let them have some setbacks and some failures and then learn from that. It's a life lesson, right? There is no part of life that anybody goes through that isn't some sort of challenge or setback. You know, I gave the example before of my daughter's senior year. This is really different than she ever expected and has to be resilient and learn how to like handle the changes that are going on and deal with the disappointment of not having a, a live graduation and a senior trip. Uh, Wendy Mogul, who wrote a great book, Blessings of a Skinny, another great one if you've not read, a good one to get. Uh, she has this fantastic line in there that says, parents should be caring, concerned, but not enmeshed in the children's lives. So we want you to be there. It's not like, you know, we don't want to say, here, go parent yourselves. No, of course not, right? We want you to be caring. We want you to be concerned. We want you to be there. We want you to have empathy. And also, don't be afraid to let them um, fail sometimes, right? Another thing I think is really cool is when we tell children about famous people's failures, right? And so I have next, I want to show you a video. This is on YouTube. You can show it to your kids. Um, it's a real short video about people's failures. I think especially young children like to hear about 
other people that they really look up to and that they had challenges and that they kept going and they didn't give up. You know, Michael Jordan, for example, right? You'll see in a second, but he uh, got cut from his high school basketball team. What happens if he just said, oh, forget it, I'm never playing basketball again. <clears throat> I mean, we wouldn't have one of the greatest NBA players ever. My children would have literally no shoes to wear on their feet, right? So that's, we want to talk about that. So this is a real short video I thought was good. I'm from YouTube. You can get it um, yourself. Um, or actually afterwards, when you're, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, you can email me and I can send you that as well. Let's just watch this and hopefully it works. After being cut from his high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. He wasn't able to speak until he was almost four years old, and his teachers said he would never amount to much. Was demoted from her job as a news anchor because she wasn't fit for television. Fired from a newspaper for lacking imagination and having no original ideas. At age 11, he was cut from his team after being diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency, which made him smaller in stature than most kids his age. At 30 years old, he was left devastated and depressed after being unceremoniously removed from the company he started. school dropout whose personal struggles with drugs and poverty culminated in an unsuccessful suicide attempt. A teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything and that he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Rejected by Decca Recording Studios, who said, we don't like their sound. They have no future in show business. His first book was rejected by 27 publishers. His fiance died, failed in business, had a nervous breakdown, and was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never tried anything new. Okay, I love that video. I think it really shows kids. Um, all these famous people had to try again and again and again. And uh, they kept going and they did it and they succeeded. Dr. Seuss, you know, I think 27 publishers. Hello, every one of us knows Dr. Seuss, right? Everyone with kid, every parent reads their kid, I think, Dr. Seuss, right? Imagine if you just gave up and we wouldn't have the cat in the hat or all these famous, famous books, right? <clears throat> I know I have a child, <coughs> excuse me, um, with dyslexia and we spent some time also talking about some famous people who have dyslexia and that they've overcome and what they've, what they've achieved. So any, any type of, you know, people do with children who have ADHD. So I think it's a really nice thing to do to, um, show kids some role models and show kids that people have bounced back from adversity and really been able to succeed. So let's keep talking about ways to promote a growth, promote a growth mindset. So we want to encourage and model positive self-talk and really the self-talk what we tell ourselves is really where the thinking starts to shift, right? We're reframing and teaching kids to focus on what they have rather than what they don't have. So, um, and you don't have to be perfect to be a role model parents and Parents sort of think that way, but no, it's okay for your kids to let you see um, some failure and bounce back. And I think it's important to sort of talk out loud often. And so your kids can hear you talk through, you know, talk through that. You know, it's really frustrating that school got canceled and that I can't go to my office anymore, right? I like coming to my office, but you know what? Now I can work from home and I get to see my kids every single day, right? A couple of my kids don't 
go away to school. So now we're all home. So I sort of talk about like, it is challenging. I don't, I like being in my office. It is a lot harder to work from home, right? Every time I sit down on my computer, somebody needs a snack. Right? But I also get to see everybody every day, which is really wonderful for me. And we get to have family dinners every night, which didn't happen in the past. But all of us, six people in my family, six of us sit at the dinner table every night now. So there's some really positive things that come from these challenges during this pandemic. So when we do that, imitation is a really powerful way for kids to learn. And they hear us and they see us and they can learn that way. Um, so let's just, there's a little thing on the side here to give you some more ideas, uh, how to sort of change a little bit and shift our thinking and reframe it. So instead of saying something like, I'm not good at this, instead say, what am I missing? Or, you know, I'm awesome at this, say, I'm on the right track. I give up. Try something like, I'll use some of the strategies we've learned. This is too hard. This may take some time and effort. I can't make this any better. I could always improve, so I'll keep on trying. I, I can't do math. I'm going to train my brain in math, right? So the more practice, right, I'm making more of those connections, rewiring our brains to make more connections with the more practice in math. I made a mistake, right? Mistakes help me learn better. Oh, she's so smart. I'll never be that smart. I'm going to try to figure out how she does it and so I can try. I'm going to see what strategies she uses, right? Does she study more than I'm studying? Does she have different study skills? Maybe it's not more, maybe just different study skills. Maybe I need to change my study skills. Plan A didn't work. It's a good thing there are 25 more letters in the alphabet, right? Or it's good enough. Is this really my best work? And sometimes my kids bring home, when they bring home their report cards, I'll ask them, are you happy with this, right? And sometimes they'll say, yeah, I'm really proud of it. Sometimes they will know, and I'll say, well, let's think about ways that we can improve. Right? How do you want to change that C to a B or that B to an A or whatever it is? And we'll talk about ways to um, change how we're doing, how we're learning, what we need to focus on to, to improve. We also want to help our children manage their emotions, right? This is really, really important. We want to give them empathy especially right now, this is really challenging. And I see a lot of parents, um, you know, we're home with our kids all day. And if you've got little ones with this craziness, they tend to be a little more clingy than they ever were before. Sometimes they have less patience. Our kids are a little bit more short fused now. We're dealing with all these struggles during this pandemic. So we want to give them empathy. And sometimes I think we forget when our kids are little, their emotions are as big as adult emotions, even though they're pint sized. Right? And so we want to validate and accept emotions. Of course, we're not accepting all behaviors. So if your kid's angry and throwing things across the room, we're going to validate that anger, acknowledge an anger. It isn't okay to throw things across the room, right? So validation of rules are not mutually exclusive and exclusive. And I think it's really important to mention here that we also have to give ourselves empathy because we are also under a lot of stress right now during this time. And that we have to have compassion for ourselves, right? And give ourselves as parents permission to feel and experience our, our emotions and give ourselves compassion, really, really, truly have compassion for ourselves and give ourselves a space to acknowledge and accept our emotions. And when we can do that for ourselves, then we can help our children better. And, and you know we are all overwhelmed by this really unprecedented time. So I just want to take a minute to say empathize with our children, but also be compassionate and empathize with ourselves. Practicing mindfulness, right, is a really big um, resiliency building block. And so what's mindfulness? I think lots of people you talk, talk about mindfulness. What is it? It's focusing on the present moment, the here and the now, what is going on right now. Oftentimes, right, I'm guilty of this myself. We think about the past, we ruminate, we ruminate and ruminate and ruminate, or worry about the future, what's going to be, what's going to happen, especially right now. We have no, there's so, so, so much uncertainty right now about the summer, about the fall. And so mindfulness brings us to this present moment, right? Our thoughts at this moment, what's going on right now, and it's non-judgmental, meaning no thought is good or no thought is bad. They're just thoughts. It allows us to improve our focus and our attention. And what happens is um, oftentimes when we're feeling anxious, overwhelmed, or stressed, our amygdala, which is um, like almond-shaped uh, organ in, in our brain, uh, gets hijacked, and that causes that fight or flight response. Again, normal in this abnormal time that we're going through right now. And what happens is when our amygdala gets hijacked and we go in that fight or flight response, the front part of our brain, the frontal cortex, gets offline. And that front part of the brain is where we have 
uh, make our logical thoughts, our rational decision making and problem solving. We want to turn that back online. So and calm the amygdala and turn that back online. So our mindfulness practice help does that. Calms the amygdala and let that frontal cortex, which is again where we do our decision making and logical reasoning and problem solving, get back online. So how do we do mindfulness? There's lots of different ways. And here I'll just give you some examples. One is this, I have this picture here called square breathing. Um, it's called square breathing because it's you do four different things and hold for four seconds, so it kind of makes a square. So the first thing you do is you breathe in, you know, it's for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, then you breathe out. So in is four seconds, hold for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, then you rest for four seconds, and then you do it again. Um, I'd love us to try this if we can. If I had a room full of people, we'd all do it together. So I'm going to count on you trying this with me. So we're going to breathe in for four seconds, two, three, four. You're going to hold your breath four seconds, two, three, four. You're going to breathe out for four seconds, two, three, four, and just kind of rest there for two, se four seconds, two, three, four. Now, I often do this with my kids that I work with here in the office, even my own kids. I'm like, that's stupid. I don't want to breathe. It doesn't help. Right? They all say that. And it actually does help. There is research, just so you know as a parent, that it does actually help. There's lots of research to show that it really does calm us, calms our, our actually our lungs, because when we go into fight or flight, the lungs start beating really fast and we have shallow breathing. There's this connection between the brain and the lungs, so we slow our lungs down, slows our brain down, and gets our frontal cortex back online. But it also has to be done multiple times. Right? One breath like that isn't gonna help, right? 10, 15, 20 breaths, kids need to know that. And that the more they practice, the more it'll help and the better we'll get at it. Just like when we talked about building our brain muscle, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more that we breathe and practice this mindful, mindfulness breathing, the better we'll they become at it, the more comfortable it will be, the less weird it will feel and the more it will help. Some other ways to do mindfulness with kids is go take a nature walk. Walk through, we are blessed here in Cleveland to have so many metro parks and the Colorado National Valley and so many places to go into nature and to walk. Do that. Um, yoga, practicing yoga is very helpful. Eating mindfully. Take the next, the next snack you take, eat it mindfully. Don't just kind of shove it in and, and chew and swallow it, right? Take a, let's say you're taking an apple, right? Before you eat it, look at it. Notice, is it smooth? Is it rough? What color is it? Does it have a smell? Take a bite of it, take a bite, don't chew it yet, hold it in your mouth, think about the feeling of it on your tongue and your cheeks. Does it smell different? Does it taste different? Does it feel different? Chew it, slowly chew and feel that. So you're really taking a snack or any type of food and slowly, slowly, mindfully eating it. It's focusing on the moment, not just like chewing and swallowing it and realizing, did I even eat an apple? Right. Um, the other thing I love to do is, is think about is use what I call spidey senses. Right. Those of you who know Spider-Man are spidey senses. Just sit wherever you are. If you're in nature, you could do this. If you're sitting at your desk right now, close your eyes and use your spidey senses. What do you hear? Do you hear a clock ticking? Do you hear, in my office now, I hear a truck behind me? Do you hear kids screaming? Uh, what do you smell? Is something cooking in the oven? Just those spidey senses to bring us to here right now and focus on, on the moment right this second. Um, you can also do for kids, it's called a calming jar. You can Google this. There's tons of uh, directions on online how to do a calming jar, but essentially you take a jar, glitter, and some glue, and you shake it all up. And as the glue, the kids kind of look at it, and as the glue slowly settles to the bottom, it kind of helps calm, and they can focus on, again, the present moment. So those are just some ways to sort of practice, practice mindfulness. And we talked about, right, resilience kids are good problem solvers. So if they've never done this, it's going to be hard for them to start doing this. So let's help them and give them the language to be able to solve their own problems, right? When they're upset about something, well, well what worked before, right? Or if there's a role model or somebody capable person, somebody they look up to, it could be an older sibling, could be a cousin, grandparent, could be a teacher, could be anybody, somebody they look up to. Well, what would they do in this situation? Well, we can talk about, you know, Let's just think about all the silly ideas you have, right? Let's just brainstorm. You have this problem. Here's all the silly ideas. You come up with all the ideas you can think of. I come up with all the ideas you can think of and we can kind of go through, right? So if your kid says, I, I hate the Zoom learning. It is not working for me. My, so I'm just, I'm never coming back again. Okay. You write it down. Never going back again. And you just hear it all and hear them out. And then you can go through and say, well, you know, 
we got to finish school. It's almost over. We got a couple weeks left. We got we got to finish it. And they know, they know. But let's let them get out all the silly, crazy ideas. You never know if a silly, crazy idea might actually work. I had one child who mornings was really, really difficult. Getting dressed, getting up, getting dressed, lots of transitions. And so we brainstormed. And so the um, idea that my, my child came up with was, I'm going to go to bed in my clothes. So that takes one transition out in the morning. So every night they got into their pajamas, they got into their clothes the next day, instead of their pajamas, slept in it, woke up the next morning. And I got to tell you, from that day forward, mornings were so much easier. And when we talk to our kids and say we're noticing a problem that maybe like they're not noticing the problem, one way to start the conversation with them is to say, I noticed. It's a very easy way to start. It's not judgmental. No one's going to get defensive. Hey, I noticed this is going on. Let's talk about it. So just using that little phrase of, I noticed, is very helpful when talking to kids and especially teens. Talk about kindness. Kindness is like a superpower that we have, right? Kindness is a really effective resilience tool. It helps us focus on um, hope and positive thoughts, right? We can do little things. We can bring the newspaper in from the end of our driveway to the porch to our neighbor's house. We can, you know, for cleaning out our closets for summer, maybe donate some of the stuff to Goodwill. Um, maybe an older sibling can help a younger sibling with their homework. It doesn't have to be big. It can be little things, but kids really feel like they have a sense of purpose when they're kind and when they help others. And it's a very powerful lesson for children to learn and realize that this world is a better place because they're in it, because of something they, do they did, they made somebody happy and they helped somebody. And then they feel a sense of gratitude which then goes to more positive feelings about themselves. And I think it also, on a side note, teaches them that it's okay to ask for help. And there's no shame in it. So there's ever a time in their lives where they do need to ask for help, they realize they know it's okay and that people want to help. And again, there's not really a shame or embarrassment for asking for help. So again, kindness is a superpower. Um, and I think really important right now, there's so many I see all over the place, on the news and Facebook, everywhere, the different um, kindness acts that people are doing for each other. And I save this, as we say, last for not, not least, but it's really the most important, and that's kind of why I put it last. Um, this, when we talk about resiliency, the most common factor for children who are resilient is having at least one supportive person in their life. You can have many, many, but at least one. And as a psychologist, Julius uh, Siegel says, a charismatic adult. And what he means by a charismatic adult is someone that a child gathers their strength from. Right, a source of strength, right? one person in their life that they have a committed relationship with. Um, we are all wired for connecting, and it is important to have that. And it's great if there's more than one. We need at least at least one person. And I want to say that, especially right now, with um, not being able to see each other except through like Zoom, we want to make sure that, especially if this uh, charismatic adult and supportive person isn't living in the home, that our kids have an opportunity to connect with them through phone calls or through Zoom. Um, even with their friends, right? You may not be not their supportive adult, but um, we want to keep them connected with people as much as possible because we, like I said, we as people, as humans, are wired for connecting. We really, we need it. And I want to say that it's best to also, when we talk about the supportive relationships, to uh, call or Zoom call or FaceTime, something like that, rather than texting. And I'll tell you why. There was a study that was done with fourth grade girls, and they were randomly divided into two groups. And half was selected to call their moms for comfort. The other half was selected to text their moms for comfort. So girls that called on the phone um, felt more comforted, they felt more relaxed, their actually blood pressure was lower, their cortisol levels were lower. The girls that texted their moms for comfort had no lessening of stress. It did not help to text. And that's because we have what's called in our brains, what we've discovered called mirror neurons. And whenever we see or hear somebody, the mirror neurons get fired and activated. And that leads to connection. And when we have a connection, that makes us honestly feel better and helps comfort and to calm us. So much better to call or Zoom rather than just send a text to somebody. Just kind of wanted to say that and how important that is. So I want to show you a cute little comic I found. Hopefully everybody could, could read that. It's, who's the smart one? 
Uh, this is from Calvin and Hobbes. So what happened to you, Susie? Says Hobbes and I had a frank exchange of ideas. What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing, homework? I wasn't sure I understood this chapter. So I reviewed my notes in the last chapter and now I'm rereading this. You do all that work? Well, now I understand it. Ha, huh. I used to think you were smart. So this goes back to our sort of growth versus fixed mindset, right? So Susie has a growth mindset. She didn't understand it, so she went back and reviewed it and reread it. Calvin obviously has a fixed mindset. You got it or you don't. There's no point in going back over the homework. And so I thought that was a really cute cartoon to sort of emphasize what we talked about here today. So we really focus a lot on different um, sort of skills and strategies to use when we want to build our kids' resilience. And again, I want to just reiterate that, that, that kids can learn resilience at any age. We all have the capacity to do it. And hopefully you gained some knowledge from this presentation and how to go and, and work with your kids and help your kids. And if you have any questions, I can check the chat box now. Um, I will, here is my contact information. You can please email me or call me, courtney.evancheck at thinkaplus.com. Happy to answer any questions. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, um, I can send you that as well. Um, let me look and see if anybody has any questions. Okay. Great, okay, not seeing any questions right now, so please feel free to reach out with any, any questions concerns, anything you may have. It was a pleasure to present today. And this is my first Zoom presentation, so that was kind of exciting and fun for me. Um, all right, take care, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.